Well, I am so happy to have on with me Bill and Sherry Kinnison. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, Bill, I spoke with you, I think next week will be a year because I remember yeah, when you first came that. on. Yeah. When you first came on the show, you said, how was your Christmas? So I think it was like a few days after. So, <laughs> that was a year ago. That was a year ago. So I'm going to ask you, how was your Thanksgiving? <laughs> Thanksgiving with oh we we had three Thanksgivings didn't we, we yes just, we did sure. we got invited you know people just invited us and we just did a little a little here nice. yeah we, we knew them now don't just yes. act like we just showed up <laughs> no, places. I know. no we were invited so yeah. and our granddaughter had to leave town so I did a little Thanksgiving the week before for her so nice how old are your grandchildren now 11 and 5. Wow. It goes fast, right? Yep. Yeah. Much faster than you like. Much faster. You start realizing age comes so quick. You want to grow up and then here it is. It does. I remember being young, just wanting to grow up. And my sister took me aside and she goes, listen, I was in high school. This is going to be probably the best time of your life. You don't have to, you don't have to work. You don't have bills. Enjoy it. <laughs> and it's oh, true. This and then real life hit you. Exactly. Exactly. So we just, we just, um, yeah, we celebrated Sam's, was it his 70th birthday? 70th birthday. I can't even imagine him at 70. I know. I can't I, either. I know. I think he still would have been the same. <laughs> Oh yeah, maybe, he wasn't. Maybe he, some gray hairs. That's about it. Yeah. There, maybe well, how about hair. missing hair? <laughs> he, he, he probably he probably would look like me now. Yeah. <laughs> would have still wear his berets and had that long. He's, yeah. Now, how did how did he come about wearing the beret? Was that someone's idea? Did someone give it that's to him? Because he didn't wash his hair. <laughs> and and he didn't he didn't very want often. You to see his bald spots. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I would like you thing. to do, if you can, um. For the the young generation that that never saw Sam, never saw his his stand up, which is hysterical. And let me tell you, it has gotten me through some really rough times. I, I just remember just putting it on just so I could laugh because life was a little rough at that time, you know. And just I've had amazing. I've had literally probably thousands of people say that same thing that he got them through things. Yeah. Especially the guys. If they had a divorce, they go, Sam got me through it, man. Right. So, I was like, well, maybe he should have worked on his own a little bit. Well, it's amazing. He's been gone 30 years. And it, the people that still can recite and remember and yes. and talking about some, we've had some young people reach out and say, oh, my gosh, my mom, my dad, they turned me on to Sam years ago. I was really young. And now they're old enough to understand it all. So. Yeah, it's craziness, but yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'd have my kids watching Sam. But, uh... Well, his clean stuff was the clean life. stuff is good. Yeah, like I, I got a kick out of. Uh, well, I think I told you my favorite was the Sands bit, of course. Yeah. That's um, what got him famous. I <laughs> got him famous, but I, I, I love that skit, and then the Marlboro. 7-Eleven. Oh, yeah. Smokey, smokey. <laughs> smokey, smokey. How do you work? How can you, you, you don't speak English. How do you, you know, you know, work in this? And I know a lot of this stuff is, it's, it's, it doesn't age well because you can't get away with a lot of that now. Well, he wouldn't have been politically correct. I always say, you know. And, and he would not have changed. He wouldn't have. You know, he just, that, he just wouldn't. I mean, when I talked to him before, well, you just brought up that routine on Rodney Dangerfields, and we were going over, you know, what he was going to do for six minutes, because that's the only time we had. And he said he was going to, to uh, do that. And I go, well, Sam, you're going to find out if you're really funny, because if you make people laugh over children <laughs> starving to death, you better be funny. And he was. All right, we move along this time now. Here's a guy who's rather unusual. <laughs> And I love people who are different, you know? When I say rather unusual, you know what I mean when you meet him, okay? We all love him here. Let's have a nice, warm reception for Sam Kinison, okay? Here we are, Sammy. Ah, baby, here you are. Baby, I love you. I love you. Well, like I said, I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to just do whatever I can for people. 
like the world hunger thing, the USA for Africa. That's, isn't that great? You guys hear the song? Nice song, isn't it? Beautiful. I'm, uh, I'm like anybody else on the planet. I'm very moved by world hunger. I see the same commercials. Those little kids starving and very depressed. And uh, you know, I watch these things on TV and I see those commercials and I look at it and I go, God, how cruel, you know? To see the little kid out there and I go, fuck, you know, I know the, uh, the film crew could give this kid a sandwich. <laughs> you know the kid's not out there, uh, you know, filming a letter from home with a Betamax, huh? You know, there's a director five feet away going, don't feed him yet! <laughs> I'm not trying to make fun of world hunger. Matter of fact, I think I have the answer because I spend a lot of time working it out. And uh, if you want to stop world hunger, stop sending them food. Don't send these people another bite, folks. You want to send them something? You want to help? Send them U-Hauls. Send them U-Hauls, some luggage, and send them a guy out there that goes, hey, you know, we've been driving out here every day with your food for like the last, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And we were driving out here a day across the desert, and it occurred to us there wouldn't be world hunger if you people would live where the food is! You live in a desert! You understand that? You live in a fucking desert! Nothing grows out here! Nothing's gonna grow out here! You see this? Huh? See this? This is sand! Yeah! It's sand! You know what's gonna be 100 years from now, huh? It's gonna be sand! It's hysterical. And it was so true. That's why, because like, you, you know, the cameraman <laughs> could give him a sandwich. Hold. I mean, you think about it. It's so true. Yeah. <laughs> These kids said they got flies on their face and they're crying. And it's like, stop well, There's it. a cameraman right there. You that's got a right. director going, don't feed him yet. That's right. Don't feed him yet. I want hunger. <laughs> I want hunger. And they're like that, as you know, in this business. That's right. That's right. Yep. But you, you know, when you just did that, you sounded like him. Do you get that a lot? Do people say you sound like him? Yeah. Well, I used to do a lot of his uh, radio interviews as him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When he was alive, it, yeah. the way it started was we were actually in Austin, Texas, and getting ready to do a show. And our promoters uh, got a hold of me. Oh, I don't know. Probably was about three or four o'clock. And said, so we need Sam to do a... Uh, some radio mm -hmm. before the show tonight. And I go, it's not going to happen. And, uh, and they said, well, we really need him to do it. And I go, guys, he'll be there for the show, but it's not going to happen. You know, he's not, he's not functioning here at four o'clock. Okay. And uh, so then one of them uh, so, said, well, why don't you do it? And I go, I'm not doing Sam. And uh, they said, no, man, you sound just like him. And so they finally talked me into it. So I said, all right, I'll do it. But no, uh, no station IDs. And uh, we're over in five minutes. And uh, that's it. And I walked up a thousand people. And once Sam found out that night that, that we'd got away with it, from then on, if he wasn't in the studio or, I mean, like Howard would have picked it up in a second, Howard Stern. He'd have picked it up. It was me in a second. Because he was very close but, uh, with him and him. But no know. one else, no one else ever did except a guy in Boston. And we were flying, we flew up there and oh, yeah. and his name was Mark Parento. And he's about six foot eight. And uh, he was the the uh, morning guy. And so they, they were sponsoring our show. So he got to go up and introduce him and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, Sam gets out there and well, well, when, first we're in the limo. And going out there to a place called Worcester, there outside of uh, Boston. Oh. And as we're driving in this limo, a uh, parental calls and says, We need Sam to do a uh, do some radio. And um, we're out, we're on our way to the venue. And so I said, Well, let me see. And I put it on mute and I go, Sam, they want you to do some radio. He said, You do it, man. And uh, and so I did. 
So I go on and do it. And now we're at the show. Prino has just put Sam up on stage and Sam's going nuts with the crowd, you know, and they're all going nuts. And then Sam goes, how many heard me on, on uh, at five o'clock on WBCN? And they're all like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, that wasn't even me, man. That was my brother. <laughs> well, I'm five foot five. Parental six foot eight. And he's standing next to me. And he gives me this look like, uh, really? And so I told him, I said, it was me or nothing. So That's right. Deal with it. That's right. And uh, well, it ended up being, then when I wrote my book and I put in there, you know, I used to do some of his his uh, radio stuff and the, and I put the story about Mark Parento. He's the only one that ever, you know, ever, ever caught it. And uh, so Parento calls in to Howard Stern and I'm on there. He calls in and goes, uh, you didn't fool me, man. Well, I don't know how Howard has access to all this stuff, but almost immediately Gary runs in with the interview. Yeah. Really? So we've got Parento or Bill on Parento. And so, uh, so I'll go to play it. And so, you know, I'm doing it. Well, I'm, you know, I'm giving them statistics of what our record sales was last week and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, Howard's going, nah, nah, Brando, you didn't, uh, you never, you didn't, you didn't get it, man. Said you didn't know it was him. He goes, yeah. And he goes, no, I would have known in a second because first Sam would never get up and tell how many albums that he had sold. You didn't even know any of that. And so, uh, so that was the one time. Is that yeah. Ice T? Yep. Oh well, boy. Good friend. Yeah. I like him a lot. Anyway. Sam oh, the rapper? You talking about the way. rapper? Yeah. What do you mean he went after no, Ice T? He, he thought it was great that he was there at his show. Oh, that was at the uh, Wiltern. Yeah, at the Wiltern. And I mean, at the Wiltern. And what was funny about that is that. Uh, yeah. Sam did this whole routine about rappers. Why does how come serial killers don't take out rappers? <laughs> you know, they don't play an instrument. You know, the reason they hold their their Johnson is because they can't play an instrument. And right in the middle of this, Sam sees Ice T. Well, he's you know, he's he's, 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 he's a good he's a good friend of ours. Anyhow, so he goes, Hey brother, I I see you, I see you. Well, when we got through editing at it, uh because, you know, Ice-T stands up and goes, yeah, Sam, <laughs> you're the man or whatever. Well, when we edited it, whenever Sam said, you know, why don't, why don't one of these serial killers take out all the rappers and everything else? Well, you got Ice-T standing there going, that's right, Oh, Sam. that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so he had some choice words for us having fun after the show was over. I'm sure. He was just having fun with it. But some choice words about us. <laughs> wow. Well. Now, how did the two Sherry reunion... opened that. She actually opened that show. Did you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How did the two of you meet? When we were kids, our mom and dads were. Um, I wasn't a kid. I was nineteen. He, well, no. When we first met, I never met you till. No, I, I know it, but oh. I mean, Sam and I were like ten years old, and um, mom and dad and their mom and dad were both ministers, and they lived in Peoria, Illinois. We lived in Rockford, Illinois. And so they would come up to our church and and Sam didn't want to go home because their bedrooms were in the Sunday school rooms of the church. Well, we lived in the church. And we, we had a church. house at least and they loved it. And mom cooked. And so anyway, we met when we were little kids. And she was in high school when I met her yeah. and uh, they just started busing. Yeah, he was the rebellious one. So he was. Yeah, yeah, I've always been the out of control one. You've seen Sam and everything, but I'm the one that's out of control. I never would have guessed he it. <laughs> he hated church. That's all. And so I, I fell in love with her, with her dad. We immediately became best friends. And I, I would go up and stay at, at their house. <laughs> and I liked her brothers. Well, they started this busing and she had to go clear to the other side of Rockford, about a 30, 40 minute drive each way to go to school. Yeah. So she would come in and wake me up. And go, uh, you need to get up and take me to school. Well, it's 5 30 in the morning. And I'm like, go get your dad. I said, no. I said, get one of your brothers here. And she said, no, you're staying here. You can take me. <laughs> and so I would, I'd get up and I'd take her clear across town when it's freezing and snow and everything else. And then instead of telling me, you know, thank you, I really appreciate you telling, 
All she would say is, I get off at three. Don't uh, <laughs> don't be late. <laughs> Love it. That's I, how I met her. I had to go to work after that, you know, so I didn't drive yet. Right. She's a woman who knows what she wants. Yes. <laughs> it hooked him. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Oh, uh, we had fun. What a fun life. Aw. And you have so many great memories, and I really appreciate that you share them. You know, I, I really do. I mean, you guys are like the closest connection to Sam right now for and, his fans. And, and and we've always been very open. I mean, you know, we're an open book pretty much of, of life. Why try to hide it? You know, what yeah. what we went through, what he's been through, you know, what it, it was not yeah. easy, but we did it. Yeah. And your memories are what gets you through life. That's right. That's right. And if you could help someone along the way with what you've learned from, yes. you know, things that you've gone through, oh, then, you yeah, know, well, all, all the better. Yeah. Now, we one thing we didn't that. talk about last time was um, Sam's childhood. He was, he was. Um, you remember I, all that or you have notes from last time? <laughs> no, I remember. Oh, man, I remember. You got a well, memory. I remember leaving off with you saying, I want to have you back on again because I still have some more questions. <laughs> and then I'm like, what were those questions I was thinking the other day? What were those well, questions? Well, that's right. You said you had a bunch of questions and we didn't get to them. <laughs> I said I have a few more. I do remember that. So, um, yeah, because I heard I heard that, yeah, that Sam, he was one way and then he was like hit by a, a car or something and then he changed. Can you talk about that? Talking when about he was a car. child? When he was hit by the car. When he well, was he was child. three years old at that time. Yeah. And uh, and it was a kind of a we we lived in the projects, same projects as Richard Pryor, which uh, blew uh, Richard away when I told him because he didn't believe me at first. And then he's like, "What was your address? What was your unit?" And then he is like, in his language, you know, and you really did. And I said, "Yeah, and we were white, so I don't want to hear your crap." That's right. This whole act was about you know how growing up in the projects, right? And so uh, privilege, right? So I was in school. Let's see. He's three. I had to be four years older than Sam. Yeah. I. So I had to be, I don't know, second grade, maybe. And I heard an ambulance. And don't ask me how, but I knew they were going to get Sam. And I got up and, and uh, ran out of class, ran all the way back home to our project. And, uh, and there was no one there. So I thought, well, okay. And, uh, few hours later they came back with sam and and uh, i thought they i thought they had switched babies or switched <laughs> little kids because he was all of a sudden he was aggressive and he was never like that to start with he uh, started wet in the bed again and uh, end up with 40 percent brain damage wow and uh end up with epilepsy of which he never even ever told his his wives that no he never talked about that that's the only thing he didn't reveal publicly i think yeah but i'm sure that that like um added to his his type of humor like that right because well, just, it's like he just, didn't have a filter right yeah that's exactly what really happened did. whatever happened to him he got hit by a truck he was running out to get his ball <laughs> and a truck had hit him but oh. uh, uh yeah he wouldn't have been the person that he was right if if that not have happened because it totally changed his personality, everything else. And she can tell you, because she knew him at a young age. And uh, Sam was always just, he wasn't mean, but he was he was ornery. He was ornery. And always doing crazy stuff. He just wanted to make people laugh. And that's what he was called to do. That's really what he should have been doing. Yeah. And so he started out preaching. Yeah. Well, that family business, so... And right. he was named after my dad. So he said it was like the Julian Lennon thing. I got to do it for dear old dad. <laughs> and it uh, wasn't very good. And uh, after what, five years? No, seven years. No, how long did he preach? Oh, I think he preached five years. But, you know, he was on the road. I mean, he ran away for two years. Nowadays, you know, somebody runs away and you call the police. But yeah. Murray never did. They never turned him in. But he was on, he, he lived down at Virginia Beach and just a hippie traveling and hitchhiking and he um he ministered for um pat robertson worked, wow. worked for him yeah. he worked for him wow so, and then finally one day he hears bill and rich 
on the radio because they were doing a, well he was hitchhiking across the country we were in oklahoma city yes he was um he heard the truck driver's radio and he had bill and and uh, rich were on it and sam said oh my gosh that's my brother's so that's how they got reconnected and then he came home on his own yeah and then got involved in the family business your mom your mom was preaching too right is that true Oh, uh, yeah, if you want to call it that. <laughs> she had a church in Tulsa. Well, she started in Peoria, and then she moved to Tulsa. Well, that was actually our dad's church. Yeah. And then right. after they got a divorce, that, that pretty much empties a church. Yeah. Now, you if guys had a church, let the pastor get a divorce, and, and it's they're not yeah. they're not a church anymore. Yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah. So when they got a divorce, you guys kind of like you went with your dad. And Sam went with your mom? Well, I uh, actually, the judge asked my brother Richard, because he was the oldest, and uh, who he wanted to live with. Well, Richard, you know, hadn't, you know, he had his own issues. And uh, so he told him, said, I want to live yeah. with Bill. So the judge was like, well, where's Bill at? I'm right, right here, sir. And he goes, uh, all right, well, who do you want to live with? And I said, I want to live with my dad. Now, I never forget he went, why? Who said, said why? Oh, huh? Who said why, your dad? The judge. Oh, the judge. Asked the judge. why I wanted to live with my dad. And I said, because I love him and I don't, I don't want him to be by himself. Oh. So uh, Rich and I, then Rich, he went, he went back home just to, in a few weeks. I mean, we were homeless, my dad and I. And that <laughs> That <laughs> wasn't Rich's cup of tea. And uh, so that's that's how they end up with a divorce. And then my mother, a few years later, married a preacher in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, named uh, Dr. A.D. Marnie. And uh, all of a sudden, she wasn't living in a church anymore, and uh, he was taking care of her. Hmm. Then he eventually died. Now, Mom's pastor in the church, and... There's nobody there. There wasn't anybody there. Yeah. So you know what it's like to to be in need. You know what it's like to to you know be poor. Yeah. You know, if you, you know. So and so you could appreciate. Yeah. Yes. So, so when when success did hit, you know, how, how did how did Sam handle it? Like, did he expect to be so successful or like I think he did to start with, but you know, Hollywood will kick your ass. Not and, sure. uh, I think that when he hit, he was really to a point that he, uh, was accepting that, you know, working at the comedy store and stuff is going to be his lot in life. Well, then you got Rodney Dangerfield and I went down to Houston, Sam and had, uh, got into comedy. He'd been doing it about six weeks. And I went down because Sharon and I had supported him. You know, his life up to that point, he was 25 years old. We paid his rent, paid, gave him money. To, he never had a paycheck that I ever knew of, never had a job. And uh, and so the first night that I'm watching him, Rodney Dangerfield was in Houston uh, doing a big show at the arena. And afterwards, he came over to this little comedy club because you didn't have all these clubs back in those days like you, you know, like you do now, or even right after that. And, uh, anyhow, he come over with his entourage and I told the bartender, I said, uh, uh, whatever Rodney and his, his people want, I'll take care of. So he said, all right. So he goes over and tells him, well, Rodney tells me to sit next to him. And so I sit down with him. Now he, he has no idea who Sam is. He has no idea. The two of us are connected. Yeah. He just thinks I'm a nice guy that's buying him and his and his friends drinks. And I'll never forget sitting up front and Sam's going nuts like, you know, usually did. And I remember Rodney turning around to me and goes, hey, I'm going to tell you. I can't use that language. But <laughs> that's all right. You could use it. <laughs> this, 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 this kid's a, a, an effing genius. So he's going to be big. I don't know how long it's going to take him because he's not too disciplined. But uh, uh, he's going to be big one day. Wow. And, uh, and that was seven years and, later. And the comedy that he did in Houston, I don't really think ever, anyone ever saw that. I mean, he did some funny stuff. And he well, he started out being a prop comedian. He used a lot of props. 
Did he? If you could imagine that carrying a box out on stage and wow, and and do <laughs> almost like a like Gallagher, only not not slamming up vegetables and stuff. Right, right, right. <laughs> but had a, had a box of props. Yeah, he was, fun, but he wow. was so funny. You know, yeah, he was, was a natural right out of the game. He was. And that he was, was before the screaming, right? And he was, oh, is there any footage well, of the that? The screaming never never came till he married his second wife, Terry uh, Mars. Yeah. And uh, Sherry and I, well, we mm -hmm. living in California and went to, to no, their apartment. No, we just or... went to visit him. Um, we were in town. I think we were over there. Uh, oh, we were preaching, we were preaching, preaching at the there. Bishop Matthews. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so we went, you know, Sam's apartment, and man, they're into it. I mean, they're physically into it. We could hear them through the door. Oh my gosh! So Sherry took uh, Terry Terry down somewhere, and then I told Sam, you know, we got to get out of here, man. And so we went, and I don't know, got something to eat, and then he goes, I got a spot of comedy store. Let's just go on down there. I don't want to, I don't want to go back home. And I said, How long you guys been going at it? And he said, About three days. And, uh, and I'm like, dude. And so that night he goes to the comedy store and you know that if you're miserable, you don't want to be around happy people. And Sam was miserable. <laughs> and here's this couple right down front. And for the first time I'd ever seen Sam do it. And he's really doing it cause he's mad. He's doing it cause he's pissed. Wow. He really isn't doing comedy right now. He, he's see a lot of people that know that. driving him nuts. Wow. And so he stops the show, goes down to him and goes, hey, you think about marrying her? So look at her, man. This is the best it's ever going to be. You know, you get to thinking about uh, you want to get married and uh, have a picket fence yes. around your house and and three kids and one and a half dogs. I want you to remember this face. That's he right. gets down to the guy's face and just screams. Well, that's where the scream, that's the first time the scream comes out. And the people loved it so much. He just kept it from then on. That was his trademark. That's, his That's where the scream actually came from. There you go. And I'm glad you said that because uh, the, there were talks that he stole that scream from Bobcat, which was ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Bobcat's got anything that Sam wanted to steal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He, yeah. uh, he came up to me. Bob, Bobcat came up to me. Sam had no problem with Bobcat. Bobcat had a big problem with Sam. There was no one coming to Sam's show thinking they were going to see Bobcat. But there was a lot of people going to Bobcat's show thinking they was going to see Sam. And when they wasn't, I mean, these are Sam fans. Yeah. And so uh, so Bobcat, he really took offense to it and uh, and did an interview, I think, a Playboy or something. And Sam was a 300-pound talentless. Oh, gosh. Ever. And so the war was on. Then Sam gets killed and and uh, we're at the comic relief in the back stage of comic relief. And so Bobcat comes up to me and I never thought, you know, I never thought about my words coming out and I had no, no beef with Bobcat at all. Anyhow, Bobcat goes, you know, when I got the call about, about Sam, I called three friends that I was on the outs with and, uh, and made it right. And since Sam's not here, I want to, you know, I want to make things right with you. Wow. And all that. And then I said, sounds just heartless. And I didn't mean it to be that way. But I was like, you know, Bobcat, he, Sam never took you serious. And I think he was taught thinking I was saying, you know, he, right. never, he never, he didn't take you, yeah. you know, serious. But I think he took it personal and uh, really never, ever talked to me again. But Sam built a great, I don't know, a cult crowd at the comedy store from at yeah. midnight when he would go on every oh, it'd be two in the morning. Two in the morning. I mean, he really built a, a huge crowd that would just an underground. Wait. Underground. It was it, an underground. Porno course. stars, the celebrities, who's ever out at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the word started getting out about Sam. And so they would call, they'd have it sold out on reservations at two o'clock in the morning. Wow. And the reason that yeah. Mitzi did that was to sell the drinks for people waiting to see Sam. Yeah. That's a small businesswoman. Is it true yeah. that Bob Saget brought him there? Pardon? Is it true that Bob Saget was the one that brought Sam to the comedy store? Bob Saget? No, not that I know of. Oh. Probably the one more responsible for uh, Sam coming to the comedy store was probably Richard Belzer. 
Okay. Because uh, Sam was up in New York with his girlfriend, and then he realized, you know, he ain't going to make it in New York. You know, if you're in theater or something, that's different. Yeah. But for stand up, that was, you know, that was and so. Uh, Belzer told him, said, dude, I'll make a call. You need to go to the comedy store in LA. And that's where he went. That's, and then he tried out. He did his, his uh, set. And uh, all of us, all of us thought Sam would hit when he got to LA. I mean, we just were sure of it. Yeah. Except Mitzi. And uh, she so watched him. Then he came over to the, table and I was sitting in the booth with uh, Mitzi and he goes well what do you think Mitzi and she goes you're not funny really yeah you need to go back to driving a truck or whatever you do because you're not funny but I'll tell you what I'll do I'll let you be a doorman and you can see how the pros do it and so uh, Sam was so desperate he didn't know he's going to be a doorman for five years but that's that's what he was. But he built up his following. He built up his act. Uh, yeah. And Polly became good friends with him. Well, Polly was like twelve years old at the yeah. time. Honey. Yeah. Yeah. Polly became good. Polly Shaw. Sure. That's yeah. Mitzi's son was Polly Shaw. Sure. Bob Saget was that the the comedian that Rodney <laughs> replaced Sam with? No, that was Tim Allen. Oh, okay. That right. Sam replaced him um, because. I saw an interview, uh, Bob Saget was on with Joe Rogan and he goes, very, very good friends. Both of those very, very good friends. Yeah. He goes, I, he goes, I was the first one to bring Sam over to the comedy store. That's why I asked, had asked you that because he had said well, that he, maybe. maybe he did in his world. I don't know. Right. 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 Um, and so for you now, you went, you went also, you were preaching. You yep. were also preaching. So you went from being a preacher to managing your brother. Like, yep. how was that transition for you? And you never managed before. Was it a tough task? Well, it was a, no, no. The, the preachers made it very easy for me because uh, every one of them blacklisted me. <laughs> every single one that I knew. Right. We were big. Sharon and I were big at that. We we go into a town and draw 5,000 people in a night. Wow. And, uh, and we were big, but once... When we did that first HBO special and, and the first credit on it was I was the producer on it. And uh, man, once that came out, it was over, which yeah. I didn't care. I mean, uh, you know, but we thought we were getting out of the ministry. And truth of the matter is, we never did get out. We just had new people. You know, I mean, uh, Robin Williams, I, I, I did his uh, eulogy. At his funeral, Fred Willard, I did his eulogy. You did his funeral. Um, yeah. Mary, I did her. Well, that is doing the funeral. Okay. And everything else, and we got to just be, you know, really, really, really close friends with, with all of them, and they were so intrigued, yeah. uh, with the ministry. I remember Robin telling Sherry and I one night, said I would like to be a real preacher for one night. One night. Really. And I said. Why would why would you want to do it for one night? And he said, I'd like to see what it really feels like to change somebody's life. Wow. And I said, Robin, you change their life every time you go on stage. He said, you know what I mean, man. You know, I'd really like, I'd just like to know what it feels like to change the course of someone's life. Yep. And uh, Robin was a good guy. I loved Robin. Yeah. And Richard Pryor, he said, yeah, Richard. I feel like I should have been a preacher but you know he he doesn't realize he really was a preacher his whole life he changed lives by the hundreds by the thousands and you know he well he said, could do it better than most preachers i knew yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah when you have that 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 charisma and and people can you know uh resonate with you and feel that connection yeah i mean they could be a used car salesman and they're going to sell you a car you know because you you feel like you can trust them uh, Steve Harvey also. I don't know if he was. Oh, I love Steve I Harvey. Love Steve Isn't Harvey. He the best. Oh my gosh, he's so good. Yeah. And you know now he's he's more open about being a preacher's kid and and than he used to be. But um, he knows what it's like, you know. Just it, and it really is just still to this day. I mean, we have people that we that call us that want to counsel with us or, you know, you just they they know that we're going to be honest with them and, and give them love and, and whatever we can help them with. It's, it's gotta, it's going to work to be a giver. Yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, that's what it's all about that, you know, they say you can't take it with you. All you could do is take souls, 
you know, when, when, people, <laughs> right. It was true. It is true. Oh, you know, gosh. be, be, be the hope for the hopeless, yep. you know? Yeah. So what, what is your, what is your um home like during the Christmas season? Do you have any special traditions or? Um, Just hectic. Yeah. I mean, I, we used to, but now everybody's gone, except we have our daughter, Ginger, and then yeah. our granddaughter, she'll be in California this year for Christmas. And then we'll have our grandson, but we used to all go to Tulsa and be at Bill's mom's house. And, yeah. and it was always a good time. It was funny. And it's, Sometimes we'd have it, after we moved to California, we'd have it pretty much at our house. Well, we would take, we owned a, a 400 seat a community theater. And everyone that was around that theater that had no one to have okay. Christmas with, we had them to our house. So we'd have 30, 40 yeah, for dinner. people oh. having a Christmas oh, dinner wonderful. with us. And we try to get everybody yeah. something. So they got a Christmas and a gift and Oh, that's so nice. Nice. It's just amazing how many people they don't really yeah. are by themselves in this world. And yeah. that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. This is the hottest time of year for people that are alone. It really is. Yeah. So um, I don't know. The years just go by and now yeah. it's just Bill and I pretty much. Well, we're all that's left <laughs> on either side of ours. <laughs> Oh, well, that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, my, my, my parents are gone, you know, uh, my in-laws are gone. So I'm kind of like, and my husband is gone. So I'm the matriarch of the family, you know, and, and I try to keep the traditions, you know, the best I can, but yeah, it's, it's different. It's not like when everybody was here, you know? Yeah. And, you know, this year just seems like we've lost so many yeah. that, that everyone has known. You know, you've lost, uh, just, I'm sure, more seems like this year than oh, yeah. any year I can remember I have. You know, they're, yeah. it almost seems like one or two a week. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, when you get old. It's true. You know. Yeah. Watch it, Sam, at Christmas was a hoot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, watching him open his presents. Well, that's after he woke up, which wouldn't be till four or five that yeah. afternoon. And then poor little Ginger, Ginger, she wouldn't open, she wouldn't open her gifts until Uncle Sam was there. She'd Aww. be all dressed up and Sam would be laying there and I'd say, wake him up. No, mom, no, mom. I'd say, go wake him up. Tell him it's time to open presents. Oh, oh my gosh. I love, I love the, the birthday tribute that she, she put on Facebook for him. So she did. She, yeah, she they were very close. They, they were very was, close. Yeah. And then she did, she posted a picture of him and her she had another picture she was she was going to post but we couldn't find it uh, in the spin magazine what's on the outside of it is the cover yeah the cover of the magazine and they're both yelling <laughs> in each other's face and she's only like two three That's yeah three maybe we did that up in new york yeah uh -huh. oh. now um i wanted to ask you about sam's daughter did, did he know that that was his daughter before he passed we don't know. We yeah. only never mentioned know. it. She knew. Yeah. I didn't, but she did. You did? And we reconnected uh, about three or four weeks ago. That's wonderful. Which I'm really, 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 really happy about. And she's in, uh, she's going to Bowling Green University there in Western Kentucky and, and everything. And I'm looking forward to when we can hook up. Yes. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And that's why I, the only reason I brought it up is because I did see your post where you did say that you reconnected. I'm so happy about that. She still, she looks, a, she looks, oh, she like looks Sam. like him. Yes. Oh, she does. No doubt about it. She did. And I did a DNA. Right. And I know I didn't sleep with, with her mother. So that'd be Sam. Yeah. 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 Anyway. And, and she's not young anymore either. You know, she's, 35 what no, is she 40 she gingers age. age yeah wow no she ginger would be older than her i think so yeah. because ginger was probably three or four years at the baby shower yeah. i think ginger was three and yeah that's about right yeah she would just go on. did they talk yet the two cousins Ooh. no that ginger's Enjoy. tried to reach out to her i think that angela just and angelique whatever how do we or well no. she's going with angel Angel. Her real name is An Angela. I mean, uh, Angelica. 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 Yeah. She's going, but, but 
I don't think she wants to kind of reach out yet. So in, yeah, in time well, we're taking our time. Yeah, you that's, know. Well, that's it's good that she knows that you're there for her. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did tell her that, and I will, and I am, whatever she would need. Yeah. Yeah. You two are wonderful. Tell me um, about um, the gospel according to Kennison. It started out as a play, right? You had the play. Yeah. So where did the idea come from to do that play? It was amazing, by the way. <laughs> you want to tell him, sure? <laughs> you were the one that... Uh... Uh, well, I went to see a play in L.A. And I came home and I... Well, said, John Lithgow. Yeah, it was John Lithgow's one-man show. And, oh, it was... I mean, I don't, I don't like to bash anybody, but anyway, I went home and I said, Bill, I just watched a one man. Don't even tell me we don't have stories because he was, you know, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. And I said, you've got a one man show after sitting there and watching what I watched. Oh yes. You've got a one man show. And so I said, start writing. And he did. So we wrote it and did it. Got rave reviews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was very very happy with it. I mean, a lot. But of But it the, was just it was just a you know it was just a, a one man play, except but, we did have a choir and musicians and stuff. But a lot of the people that you know we used in the theater for years did not know a lot of the stories. I mean, they were intrigued with, wow, you know. But we didn't, you know, we didn't try to preach to them because we didn't want to go in saying, oh well, we're preachers and blah blah blah. So no, we never, that part of our life, we never exposed it. So they were, it, it was, it was very good. And it was just well done and um, well received. Yeah, it was great. Now, what about um, Sam Kennison's life? Was there ever like any kind of documentary? Oh, I've, I've produced four yeah. of them. Oh yeah. Just did one, uh, uh, on Vice, so Vice or Paramount? Well, I don't remember. I mean, you did it for one, but, but then I think they got bought out by another before. It yeah, I think produced. Vice did it, and then uh, Paramount bought. Yeah, I think bought Vice, and Sam was the last thing that they, you know, that they did, and then they aired. They've been airing. Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of people call us and say. Oh my gosh, we just watched it. So they've been. And it's really it. kind of a, a series. It's called The Dark Side of Comedy. And this, you know, this particular episode was Sam, but they're planning on doing Richard Pryor and Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, they're doing a lot of different comedians. And kind of like that. But uh, the other three I have produced myself. Nice. She was getting death threats. It fucked your head. He's out of his skull. That's what took this her down. This is a crazy story. Together with his three brothers, Bill, Richard, and Kevin, Sam Kinnison is raised in Peoria, Illinois. We lived in the church, you know, because my dad probably couldn't have afforded to preach if we didn't, you know. The household that Sam grew up in was a very religious household. You have to live this Bible Belt life. I'm Bill Kennison, and I'm Sam's brother and was his manager. We were hardcore Pentecost. Our dad was a fantastic, one of the greatest preachers I ever heard. And if you're a preacher's kid, you're supposed to be a preacher. Well, Sam was acting like anything other than some kid that's going to grow up and end up being a preacher. He was the type of guy you couldn't make him do anything. Well, my mother, she wasn't ever able to handle him. You know, he was a crafty little guy. Raised in a strict environment, Sam finds escape listening to comedy records he secretly brings into the Kinnison home. There was a comedian that most people probably don't even know now named Rudy Ray Moore. Girl, you may not know I'm in there, but you damn sure know I'm on there. <laughs> Sam bought his album, and we would have to go up in the attic of our church that we lived in and listen to this album because we knew that our parents would kill us. He looked at us and said, why in the world did you bring me these carrots and lettuce out here? She looked at him and said, mother you like a rabbit, you might as well eat like one. <laughs> Sam is drawn back to the church in his late teens, 
when the Kennison family is hit with a sudden tragedy. My father passed away, so that was kind of a, kind of a spiritual experience and went into ministry for a while. You have to understand that my dad, at least for he and I, was our hero. That was probably one of the hardest times that Sam and I went through together. And that's when he decided, since he was named after my father, I've got to do it for dear old dad. My brothers and I got together and we laid our hands on the casket and we said, you know, we're going to have to be the greatest preachers in the world and we're going to really uh, do our best to live for God. He's a good preacher. And to him, a good service was if he could get people laughing. And so after the service over, he'd come back and go, brother, that was great. But Sam struggles with one vital aspect of the preaching game, raising money. I didn't do very well, actually. <laughs> you were not a good minister. No. Well, not financially. I didn't, I didn't rake in the bucks. When Sam was in the ministry, he, he married a, a young lady named Gail, and they had only known each other six weeks. They were married for two years, and then Sam found out she had been cheating on him. After Sam went through all the emotions, he somehow gets it out of her who the guy was and where he's living. Sam went over to his apartment with a gun. Sam sticks a gun right underneath his chin. Then he tells him, I want you to go get everything she's ever given to you. And so this guy's going around in his apartment, bringing him pictures and notes and cards and pie pans and everything that ends up filling up a big box. The failure of Sam's marriage proves disastrous for his career as a preacher. I was 23 and uh, yeah. I've been ministering for about five years and it wasn't a good thing to have in your spiritual resume. <laughs> In that Pentecostal circles, the worst thing that could have happened to you is to get a divorce if you're a minister. They used to say, if you can't take care of your own house, you're not fit to take care of the house of God. So Sam knew it was over. I think that his background in the Pentecostal church left him with questions, frustrations, disillusionment with scripture and religion. I told him, I said, Sam, I want you to take some time and think and look down in your heart and find out what you really want to do. He took about three seconds and said, I always wanted to be a stand-up comedian. He figured, well, if I can't make it as a preacher, I'll be the antithesis of that. He, did, he went from one end to the other, but he was always an entertainer. He was always on stage. It was like two different ends of the same animal. People are intrigued with that, that part of Sam's life that they didn't know. And Right. You know, where the scream came from and all in all of that. So, yeah. Yes. And Sam's first love. What? You. Oh. <laughs> oh. He had a crush on you? Oh. Big time? He we blamed were... me. He blamed me until he died. We were, <laughs> we were like brother and sister. And I would oh. tell him, I'd say, you know what? You're like my brother. So there was never anything. But he really, he... He respected me and because I knew our life growing up. And I think that's, you know, they looked at me as like they had four boys in their family and their mom always called me her daughter. Oh, so. So you, you were family even before the two of you got married. You were, oh, yeah. You yeah. were family. Yeah. Our two families. Yeah. Uh, her parents and my parents were uh, best friends. Yeah. And, uh, we spent, as far as I can remember, we spent every Christmas or Thanksgiving together, to, together, the two families. Yep. Well, there was never any fighting and arguing, and it just was, it was fun. It was just a lot of laughter. And my brother, Ron, who was killed in 2000 oh, by a semi-truck, him and Sam were best friends. Um, and there's stories with the two of them. It's, it's, <laughs> I don't think we can tell those on here. No, I know, but... <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's just the way it was. <laughs> right, right. 